My name is Steve Brampton, and I have the uh, pleasure to be your speaker this morning. And I know John very well. We know each other for a long time, and I could spend his entire half hour introducing him, but I'm not going to do that. It's much more important. What he's about to say is much more important than who he is. But briefly, John is a true Renaissance man. He's an athlete as a level three internationally certified ski instructor. He's a scholar. He's a world traveler with intimate knowledge and experience in the history, culture, and practice of tea. He's a scientist, completely fluent in the materials and technology of our craft. He's an artist with 45 years of clay experience, exhibiting internationally with work in numerous museum collections. He's a teacher as an adjunct professor in the New Hampshire Institute of Art and a visiting professor at the Ushi Institute of Art in Yixing, China. And I'll say also that he's a spiritualist as a practitioner and student of the art uh, uh, of ya, ya, yado, Iaido, which is the art of Japanese swordsmanship. So without any further delay, your speaker this morning, my friend John Baymore. Thank you very much, Stephen. Are we on the mic? We're good. Thank you very much, Stephen. Appreciate that. And uh, always embarrassing. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, appreciate you being here. Um, interested off the top here, how many people in here are wood firers already or are very involved in wood firing? I would assume most people who came to this would be. Yeah. Um, how many own a wood kiln personally? OK. Um, my goal here is to get us to start thinking about practice, um, to look at what we do from maybe a point of view we don't normally um, tend to look at because sometimes, as you know, we can not see the forest for the trees. And it's a great analogy for uh, wood firers to use that one. We get so close to things. Whoop, did we just lose audio? Hello? We on here now? Got it? OK, I can't walk around anymore, sorry. Um, we get so close to things, sometimes we don't really see what's going on. We, we kind of block out stuff, and we see it from our own particular bias, bias and perspective. Um, I hope to give everyone in here something out of this. Um, some of you are very experienced, and there won't be anything new here. Um, some of you are very experienced and probably know as much as I do about wood firing. Um, the title of the lecture, by the way, uh, comes from a famous song, which was an oldie when I was a kid, uh, by the, uh, the Platters. Um, and it just seemed to make sense for this particular presentation. So as we get going here, um, I hope this starts a conversation about our practices and causes us to kind of think about what we do. The thing that started me off on this um, was Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> these very public images, and these are highly cropped to protect the original image. Um, you know, we all look at those and we love this. We're, we're sitting there saying, wow, cool. Um, but others are possibly not viewing that in the same way. The obvious thing that we can start off with is that lovely plume of flame that we all go, wow, cool, looks like an F-15 taken off. Um, talk to anybody who is a fireman, who, who puts out fires for a living. They have a very different view of fire. We have warm fuzzies about fire. Most people don't share that. So those images and the reality of watching a kiln fire can often have a very different response in people who are not involved in that process. Um, the other one that we need to talk about is something called respirable, respirable particulate matter, often referred to as PM10 and PM2.5. These are the little tiny particles that are solid and liquid that are so small they get into your lungs and they don't come back out. And it's, it's a real significant issue. Um, 
it causes problems with people's health. And those who are already compromised or young people are even more susceptible to problems from this than anybody else. When we breathe in this stuff, um, it, it just, it, it lives with us for the rest of our lives and has the potential to cause real problems. But aside from that, an interesting thing in my research recently, um, there's a lot of research showing now that particularly PM 2.5 is not settling out of the air very well. Um, it's actually starting to contribute to global warming, which as we know is a significant issue um, in the world. So there's more to this than meets the eye. That being said, we need to keep our perspective on this. All you have to do is stand on a street corner in any busy city, a major street corner, and you realize that our kilns all put together are not a huge impact on the environment. You know, if you compare the plume of flame and smoke off of the recent SpaceX launch, launch to, um, you know, watching the chimney of an Anagama style kiln, there's just no comparison there. Um, and coming to things like Enseca, we have a carbon footprint and a pollution footprint also that far exceeds what our kilns do of any kind. We still need to do something about this as responsible citizens of the world. Um, and when we go back to those slide images I showed earlier, all of those lovely public smoke pictures and flame pictures, um, it brings us to the idea that we may know that we're small potatoes, but others may not. And we are an easy target because for the most part, ceramic artists are not big on political clout and impact. And if somebody wants to go on what we might call a wood kiln witch hunt, um, they probably would have reason to deal with us in a manner that would not be happy for what we do. So my first interest in this, a little background, um, was a long time ago. I was uh, in charge of uh, kilns and firing at Mass College of Art when I worked there. And uh, at one point we got told we were being shut down on all of our gas-fired operations for a full year, about less than a month before the semester started with a huge program. And so I got this brilliant idea. Let's build a wood fire in the Bordigama in the middle of Boston, which we did. <laughs> Don't ask me how we got away with this. Um, at that time, I knew how to deal with smoke control, and at that time, I was thinking active controls. Active controls are basically referred to, you know, in most cases as afterburners on the system. Uh, we use portable propane cylinders to drive that because all of our main gas system was not working, and it works quite well. It raises the effluent temperature up, it puts excess oxygen, and it burns off the smoke. So outside that kiln building, you didn't know that kiln was firing, although it did have a plume of F-15 flame at the top of the chimney. There's design considerations when you go active that are important. You can't just kind of do it without altering the kiln for the most part. Uh, the chimney has to carry more gases because you're putting all of that effluent from the afterburner in there. The chimney temperature goes way up so refractories become important um, construction detail. I've done consulting work for people who were melting their chimneys. Um, obviously, roof penetration point gets hotter because that chimney structure can be really hot. But the big one with active is you're generating more CO2. You're, you're burning fossil fuel, and you're putting more air pollution into the air. I want to touch briefly on some of the regulations in the U.S. that deal with air quality. Um, an interesting one not a lot of people know about is Title V operating permits. If you produce enough pollution, um, you actually need a permit every year to fire that unit. Luckily for most of us, um, you have to burn a lot of wood a year for just a wood kiln to reach that limit of uh, poundage that they look at for total pollution. So unless you're a very big operation, you're probably exempt from any kind of issues with that. Institutions, however, can have some problems because they count the total effluent put out there, 
So if you've got multiple gas kilns and wood kilns, et cetera, you actually technically could fall under the stationary source standard and be legally required to file paperwork and apply for permits every year. Doesn't apply to most of us. One regulation that also is in place in almost every town or city is uh, what we might call a, a NIMBY uh, clause. They usually have in zoning ordinances sort of like, if we don't like it, we can shut you down. Um, so if you look at local regulations, they always have this sitting there in most locales where they can pull that out if they're not happy with what you're doing. So in most cases, if we don't have complaints, we're fine. But if you get any kind of a complaint and somehow the state DEQ gets involved, um, they have the ability to enforce the Clean Air Act. And the standard format for how they figure that out is used in most states that I've researched is a visual observation method. And it allows a very small amount of opacity over a very specific amounts of time. 20% um, opacity over any six minute period while that observer is looking. And, and to kind of give you a picture of this, and I hope that slide's better than it is down on the monitor, um, that's 20% opacity. Um, you can do that. So to step this up, 60, 80. And when you compare 80 to the reality of most Anagama-style kilns, et cetera, we're somewhere well north of that at times, and certainly often for longer than six minutes. Um, which means that if you were inspected, you probably are not going to pass that test and they're going to say, you got to do something about this. So that's kind of the, the background of why I'm talking about this stuff. Now I want to talk about um, some of the potential things we can do to address the challenges of smoke. Um, and that goes back to combustion theory. And when you look at what engineers look at in combustion, there's four main tenets they deal with. Um, the first one is air handling capacity. Second is mixing. Third is dwell time or residence. And the last one is something known as flame quenching. And we'll take the air handling capacity first because this is the place that engineers start when they design kiln units. They don't start with fuel. Like most potters, we think fuel, fuel. Um, engineers start with air and, or oxygen. Um, and this comes from the idea that in order to have perfect combustion, which is, I got that fancy word, stoichiometric combustion, you need to have a specific relationship of fuel and air. And when you have that, you get perfect combustion, which is lovely, efficient firing, and it doesn't produce much in the way of smoke. What you've got is CO2 and water vapor, obviously it gets more complex with that than that with wood. No matter how much fuel you have, you have to have oxygen present and in contact with it. So you have to have that available. Any, any fuel that doesn't have oxygen is not going to burn. For wood kilns that we typically use, the driving force behind that is induced draft, usually created by the slope of a kiln and a chimney. And that chimney structure and the path leading to it is really important. There's a number of factors that determine how much air that's going to draw. And it includes such details that we don't often think about of the smoothness of the interior surface and the nature of transitions in that flow path of that pipe you're running stuff through. Um, if you want to think of it, that chimney on the back end of a kiln is a giant hot air balloon. And the larger the envelope of the balloon, and the hotter the gas is in it, the more lifting power we have on the kiln, which gives us more air capacity. Potters tend to use rules of thumb for how we design kilns, but a lot of this is mathematical. And if you want to do the math, you can figure out a lot of the details about volume. Um, to check the intuitive stuff that potters tend to know, I ran some math on this, and it's interesting. Induced draft, pre draft pressure is linearly related to the chimney height. We all tend to know that. Um, it's also linearly related to the exit temperature of the gases at the top of the chimney. 
So if you plot them out, they're literally straight lines. So if you want 10% more air, increase your chimney height 10%. If you want 10% more air than that, increase your chimney temperature. One of the things we don't think about, whoop, actually, getting ahead of myself. Um, so if you just take an existing chimney and you put a little bit of an extension on it, you're going to get more air through the kiln. One of the common solutions to this often done by people is to stick a metal pipe up there. The problem with that is usually it's uninsulated and it loses temperature. That loss of temperature can often negate part of the height increase. And if that transition point is not smooth, it can put the two together and you can almost reduce the overall flow on the kiln. The exit point temperature is really important. Those gases at the top, represented by the blue little balloony thing there, have to get out of the way for the gases underneath it that are probably hotter. So the hotter those gases at the top are, the easier it is to maintain the flow. So having chimneys that are somewhat insulated will increase your flow rate. Mixing is the second category here. And no matter how much fuel you have and how much air you have, it'll only burn where they're mixed together. So we need to mix fuel and air. If you have air and fuel together, it goes into flame. But any fuel that is in not contact with air just goes straight on through as fuel that's hot. And any air that is not in contact with fuel goes on as air that's hot. There's a couple of types of flow involved in mixing. One is called laminar flow. And it produces high volume in any kind of a uh, tube or, or structure, but it doesn't do much for mixing. Another flow is called turbulent flow, and that's the, the, the happy thing for mixing. Um, we want to have the molecules kind of bouncing around in there and getting an intimate contact. Anytime you have a transition area in a flow, you have laminar flow away from the walls of the structure, and then you get turbulent flow at the point of the constriction in that flow. And in all cases, the higher the velocity of gases, it induces turbulence all by itself. Next concept is dwell time or residence. And the big issue is combustion doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes time for that reaction to happen. And engineers really look at this. This is a huge issue in car engine design, particularly for high performance engines. Um, Wood cracks into complex hydrocarbons. A um, huge portion of what we burn as wood is gaseous or liquid fuel. The important one for a lot of us, most wood firers like long, sinuous flames. That comes from what's called tar. Tar is really complex hydrocarbons in wood that breaks down into other things during the process of combustion. Um, if you think about that chemical soup there, the, the distinctive smell of kilns and reduction and the wood kiln firing comes from the aromatic hydrocarbons that are formed briefly during combustion and put out and escape from the kiln. You can think of this idea of combustion sort of like, you know, the fuel that tar is a pile of bowling pins and heat energy uh, being supplied to it is a bowling ball. And when that ball hits, the pins get knocked around and briefly touch each other, forming other hydrocarbon compounds. And then they fall away and they form something else. Eventually, we hopefully burn all of it. And eventually, it all becomes uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor, basically. Um, occasionally, we will leave some of those pins standing. And what happens is that's part of our smoke generation. Another important concept that we often don't talk about is something called flame quenching. If you take existing flame and you impinge it onto, when I say cold, I mean relatively cold compared to flame temperature, cold refractories, that literally can stop combustion reactions in their tracks. This is true of gas, this is true of any kind of fire operation. Same thing can happen with introducing large volumes of cold, again, relative cold, cold air all in one spot. 
that can put out, stop the combustion reactions. The obvious place, you know, we can talk about this is when you have excess fuel coming out of a kiln chimney and you've got a flame up there and it's still trying to burn and you have that relative cold air that's surrounding the, uh, surrounding the chimney, it tends to put out the fire. So if we look at kiln design aspects that relate to this, there's, there's a whole bunch of concepts that, that we deal with that all impact taking all of those things into consideration. I'm actually going to skip why I put those in there, just let you read those. Another thing we have to think about here is anagama technology. The anagama, which is a Japanese term that we all tend to use, um, evolved out of the much earlier dragon kiln in China, which migrated its way from China through Korea and into Japan. And that happened around the fifth century. So traditional anagama design originally was, you know, if you think about it, it's really old technology. There's a reason they smoke. In the summer of 2014, I had the opportunity to take a lot of these principles and put them into reality here and ended up building a relatively large anagama style kiln, but definitely not a true anagama. Um, it was my, my design, but the students in my kiln class, uh, 10 undergrads, one grad student, uh, in two weeks went from pile of materials and a roof to the finished kiln. This is Hushigigama. Um, I don't have time to go into the derivation and selection of those particular kanji for the name. It has some contexts, particularly historical. If anybody wants to know, you can talk to me, or if you already know Japanese, you may know the answer to that. Um, so this is the kiln. This is the interior looking from the front toward the back of the main wear chamber and looking from the back toward the front. So in the design of this kiln, this is sort of how we put together or, or how we dealt with all of those concepts. And the first one is just simply air handling capacity and creating draft and it's the chimney on this thing that is the starting point around which the whole thing works. Um, relatively large chimney, um, quite tall for the size of the kiln and scale of the kiln. Um, the chimney itself is 22 feet, give or take, um, from ground to the spark arrestor e exit at the top. Plus the, the kiln itself has some rise there. So by the time you get done with this, you have almost 26 feet of total rise um, out, of, out of that system that is helping to induce that. As importantly is at the other end of this, there is a large amount of primary air under that main firebox and the sizing of, and a large grate area, and the sizing of those paths for the air are such that they don't tend to plug up with coals during the course of a firing. There's plenty of space down there so that throughout the firing, even though we may have to rake a little in there, we're never raking any coals out. Um, so it, we don't see the situation you see with a lot of kilns where coals build up. And now not only are you not realizing fuel efficiency, you're not burning it, but you're plugging up your air supply. Again, it goes into a large distributed grate area, which helps with fuel and air mixing. We also have... I used a stepped arch design over the main firebox. Those ring arches are not ideal. I normally use a uh, bonded arch construction, but those steps will create turbulence above that main firebox to help with mixing on, on the stoking in the main front end of the kiln. Um, same thing tends to happen down lower on the sides. Another point where mixing is induced is a velocity change at the entrance to the chimney. That is restricted slightly, not to mention a 90 degree angle turn there. So as we have gases exiting, they tend to get mixed well before they ever reach the top end of that chimney. In dealing with flame quenching, the floors are really well insulated. When you think about where wood lands in a wood kiln, it lands on the floor of the kiln. And if those refractories are really cold, and again, we're dealing with relative cold, um, it tends to want to put out the flame, particularly earlier in the firing. So the floors here are well insulated. Also, 
as we introduce air, particularly back on the side stokes, we have multiple small introductions of air um, near those fireboxes, and those are located such so that you get deflection by the steps so that it helps to cause mixing um, in there and you don't have just straight cold air hitting one spot of, of the wood. Um, here you can see the, the air supplies that run in under the floor for side stoke areas as well as something back there calling at the moment smoke chamber. The other thing we have is passive dampers on the chimney and they're small, there's multiple, and they're never fully open. They're open in small amounts to keep the stream of air that's being introduced into that chimney distributed into the chimney evenly and not have a big blast of cold air effectively putting out and quenching what we're trying to burn up in the chimney. So a, a common term in the wood fire community in Atacama is, is stema. Um, stema is translated as smoke chamber, but if you go back to the Japanese, it really translates as throwaway chamber. And it was a, a later development in kiln technology in Japan where they basically used it not to get rid of smoke, but to even out the firing in the back end of the kiln. It turns out that if you add an air supply and distribute it and provide mixing and that chamber is large enough, you can burn off a lot of the unburned material that tends to exit on a wood kiln. And that should work on most any style of kiln. That chamber takes all of these ideas into play. So here on our kiln, um, that's the smoke chamber in the back. You don't see it in that image that I was showing before. It has air inputs again in the floor. There's a checker wall that divides the chamber. That increases velocity as well as evening out the firing in the back. It increases velocity as the gases go into the smoke chamber, helping to promote mixing in that area. So if you look at the kiln, these are all the spots on this kiln where basically we have potential air supply there. All those purple spots are places that air can be supplied in on this kiln. Firing this is pretty much the same as any other Anagama style kiln. We start the fire on the ground, and, or not on the ground, but in a, a little construction outside the firebox. Um, fire is built up in the primary air main channel on the front until eventually we move up onto the grates. Um, it's very evident early on that this thing draws a lot of air. I saw somebody, one of our students out there smiling about that. Um, very early on you notice um, you know, that it's got a strong draw and it burns really clean. Um, we tend to use hardwood mostly, although we do have pine and hemlock that gets mixed in there. Um, that selection is deliberate. Um, it's part of firing tactics. There's lots of ways to use firing tactics to cut down on smoke also, and we certainly utilize a lot of them, if not all of them, uh, during the course of the firing. The big one is keeping that air supply going. Typical kiln pulls in a certain amount of air um, in any given time based on the openings you have and the chimney temperature, um, and that doesn't change at any moment in time. You need air to burn fuel, and the typical stoke situation, we usually tend to put these large stokes in all at once. It crosses that line and goes into heavy reduction, and we get lots of smoke and flame coming out of the chimney. So one tactic here is to use more frequent smaller stokes. We get less of that unburned fuel ending up out of the kiln. So the kiln typically can look like this, but it will be burning clean. We do get some smoke, but the place we get it, as you can see here, is the smoke coming off blowholes and off the chamber, but the chimney is clean. And as John Neely, who may be in the audience, says, I can make any kiln smoke, and we can certainly do that, too, if we want to. <laughs> if you can run the video there quick. So 
So this is just an example of you know one quick uh, segment of showing some stoking, and uh, then we'll back off and, and take a quick look here at the chimney. So even though the kiln is definitely uh, sitting there in reduction and we've got a lot of back pressure running and the blowholes are, are kind of going crazy, um, burning pretty much perfectly clean at that point. No matter how clean we burn it, um, you still have particulate material that comes out anyway. There's always PM10 and PM2.5 even when you don't see it. The fired results here speak for themselves. We're getting decent results out of the kiln. Here's some examples of work by a number of the people who fired in the kiln. And I'm going to step through these quickly and not say too much. So if you're interested, we have uh, Randy Johnston and uh, Matsuzaki Kensan coming in to do a two-week firing workshop uh, this summer. Contact the college if you have any interest in that. So thank you very much for being here. I hope this gave you some ideas about uh, things you can do in your practice to, to maybe make some changes. If you're interested in a copy of the presentation or you want to talk, I will be available outside afterwards. Um, more than welcome to pigeonhole me and spend some time uh, talking about this. So thank you very much. Appreciate it greatly.